Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in the listen-only mode. During the question and answer session of today's call, you may press star 1 to ask a question. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'll turn the call over to Lauren Solkowski. You may begin. Great. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us today uh, for the Administration for Community Living's Targeted Technical Assistance Webinar. Uh, CBO impact on health system quality and performance measures. I am Lauren Sokowski with ACL and I will be facilitating the webinar. Uh, on today's webinar we will be hearing from, uh, we will be hearing two perspectives um, on quality and performance measures. One from the health plan side um, and then one from the community-based organization side in terms of helping um, plans and other organizations to meet those measures. Uh, so before we begin with our speakers, um, I have a few housekeeping announcements that I'd like to go through. Um, first of which, if you've not done so, please use uh, the link included in your calendar appointment to get on to WebEx uh, so that you can not only uh, follow along with the slides as we go through them, but also ask your questions when you have them through the chat function. Uh, if you don't have access to the link that we emailed you, you can also go to www.webx.com, click on the Attend a Meeting button at the top of the page, and then enter the meeting number, which is 665 Three two four one three seven. That's six six five three two four one three seven. If you have any problems getting into WebEx, um, please call WebEx Tech Support at one eight six six five six nine three two three nine. That's one eight six six five six nine three two three nine. Um, as our operator mentioned, all of our participants are in a listen-only mode. However, we do welcome your questions throughout the course of our webinar, and there are two ways that you can ask questions. Uh, the first, using the web, um, or actually through the web, using the chat function in WebEx. You can enter your question here. Um, I will sort through them and then answer as best we can when we take breaks for questions after each speaker presents. In addition, after the speakers wrap up, we will offer you a chance to ask your questions through the audio line. Um, and when that time comes, uh, Shirley will give us instructions as to how to queue up to ask your questions. If there are any questions that we do not get to uh, during the course of the webinar, we will follow up to be sure that we get them answered. If you have any questions you think of after the webinar, you can email them to me um, at lauren.sokowski at acl.org hhs.gov, and I'll actually uh, place my email address in the chat box in a, in a moment, so you can find it there, so you don't have to scribble it down. Uh, and then also, as Shirley mentioned, we are recording the webinar. We will be posting the, re the uh, recording, the slides, and a transcript of the webinar on the ACL website, as well as uh, M4A's mltssnetwork.org website. And I will also enter ACL's website and the M4A web address in the chat box for your reference. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, um, Sharon Williams. Sharon, now a consultant, comes with executive leadership experience in both the community-based services setting, including serving uh, as the Chief Operating Officer within the Detroit Area Agency on Aging, as well as the traditional healthcare arena, serving in executive roles at uh, CareSource Michigan, Coventry, Amerigroup, as well as Omnicare. Uh, so with that, Sharon, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lauren. Can everyone hear me? I presume you can because yeah, you're yeah. all in silent mode. Okay. okay. Well, I'd like to uh, thank Lauren and Marissa for this opportunity today. Um, I've long been an advocate for the integration of medical, mental health, and community-based services. It's a more coordinated and seamless system, and that's more optimal for the users, the consumers, the providers, the health plans, etc. As you all probably know, 
The cornerstone of the dual demonstrations and other ACA initiatives is the increase in access to quality care as well as improved quality outcomes. Quality, however, is in the eye of the beholder. Consumers judge it based on a different set of factors than you'd expect from a health plan or from regulators. Health plans are looking at quality from the perspective of market competitiveness, financial P&L implications, and as well consumer satisfaction. Today we'll focus on some of the many quality standards that impact health plans, their providers, and their consumers. Healthcare, um, you go to the next slide. Um, healthcare is among the most heavily regulated and monitored U.S. industry at the federal, the state, at the industry level, and there's a high focus on quality of care and health outcomes. This quality continuum involves significant data mining, analytics, reporting, screening, auditing, and in many cases, there's a redundancy. For example, Medicaid, Medicare, NCQA, and all the dual demonstrations will require huge reporting. There's heavy pressure on plans and their providers for data integrity in this process. Dual demonstrations in particular are under significant scrutiny, not just to lower costs, but also to improve health outcomes for the participants in the dual project. Um, quality assurance is, you know, again, in the eye of the beholder. Um, a couple of concepts that have become standardized um, from the health care perspective nationally, um, quality management goals need to include excellent care, strong coordination, consumer satisfaction, and consumer health outcomes. Uh, the Institute of Medicine defines quality assurance, which is the foundation of health plan care delivery, and the degree to which health services for individuals and populations increase the likelihood of outcomes and are consistent with professional knowledge. So from a health plan perspective, it's not Blue Cross, of, uh, the Blue Cross HMO in Pennsylvania using one set of standards and Blue Cross in California using a different set versus what a PPO in Atlanta or a PPO in New York would use. Most health plans are using some of the standardized tools that are out there, so that allows for some cost review and evaluation and comparison of health plans. So what you hear a lot when you talk about quality assurance is evidence-based services, tried and true methodology, and unfortunately, a lot of it is very clinical-based when you're talking about some of the healthcare-specific outcomes. And then again, there are performance outcomes, and we'll talk some more about that that are not necessarily clinical, but have implications for health plan operation and uh, financial performance. And then quality improvement, as defined by uh, AHRQ, is doing the right thing at the right time for the right individual. That's a very simplistic overview, but it's the underscore of everything that's related to quality services. Next slide, please. There are a number of components, um, no matter where you are, and, and I do want to emphasize that from the perspective of what health plans are looking for, you will generally find that health plans will have a quality improvement plan. There's probably not a health plan on the planet that does not have what is known as their quality Bible or their quality improvement plan, quality management plan, and it details exactly how are they going to deliver the services, the health care services, to their consumers, and many times it is population-based, the number of states requiring their Medicaid contract, but the quality improvement plan first identify what are some of the key significant uh, health care indicators in the community, and that that quality plan has to be built around that. Um, the components of a quality management program generally include the adoption of a medical quality management standard of care. And again, those standards of care are driven by nationally recognized evidence-based standards. Uh, the establishment of a quality improvement committee. In fact, many states require that HMOs and health plans, PPOs, must have an established quality improvement committee, as does NCQA, and that those committees have to have a direct reporting relationship to the board. 
there's a utilization review for the consistent evaluation of what kinds of services are being delivered. Is there consistency in the delivery of this kind of treatment for somebody who's post-hospitalized for COPD, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, there are quality management studies where you're evaluating, all right, we've got a high population of asthmatic, ch childhood asthmatic in our health plan. What kinds of things, what kinds of medical practices, preventative care, well care, post-hospitalization services and support and intervention can we provide for this population and what's the impact of the services we're providing around that? The network credentialing and oversight is a critical, critical aspect because most of the quality delivery of care comes not from the health plan itself, but from its provider network, which certainly the community-based organizations like the AAA will become an integral part of those provider networks. So how do you credential? How do you evaluate the qualifications of the providers who participate in your health plan? Do you follow those credentialing standards consistently across the board? Um, how are you providing oversight and monitoring of the data of the quality of care, member satisfaction and complaint? The grievance appeal and uh, review is a significant portion of engaging that consumer perspective. So if you've got a particular provider, you've got a high number of complaints about cleanliness of the office, quality of care, um, high hospital utilization, uh, both the high ER visits, those are some of the things that health care is taking into consideration in terms of the quality of care that's being delivered. Again, member satisfaction cannot be underrated. It's a significant part as dictated by SPED, by accrediting organizations. How well do the members feel about the services they're receiving and the quality of care? And then there's consistent and constant program evaluation, reporting, and process improvements. So it's not enough just to have these quality studies published, but you have to take something from those quality studies to identify ways to improve the delivery of care in the system. Next. Um, this is my attempt to kind of pull together how the quality impact all these various quadrants within an organization, and it's evident in many aspects of the healthcare organization's operations. From a compliance perspective, there are significant state and federal regulations and industry standards and a number of at the state level legislative initiatives. For instance, in Michigan for the Medicaid program, because we have a significant incidence of blood lead poisoning in young children, the Michigan legislature mandated that subcontracted Medicaid HMOs have to do special studies, quality management studies on blood lead screening and preventative services and engagement they were doing to manage blood lead screening and to raise awareness among their consumers. Um, accreditation is a heavy and significant portion. You can't be a Medicare Part C provider, uh, contracted health plan, if you're not accredited. There are a number of employer groups who will not contract with health plans who are not accredited. So the accreditation piece which 50 to 70 percent of the whole accreditation evaluation process is based on quality review and outcome. The financial implications for quality are significant. The whole P&L for a health plan could be positively or significantly negatively impacted by the quality outcome. And just a couple of examples. Um, you can't qualify for certain contracts, as I mentioned, if you don't meet certain quality benchmarks. There are contractual incentives built into Medicaid and Medicare, and in some cases, commercial contracts, where if you meet certain benchmarks, you get a bonus, and if you don't meet certain benchmarks, then there's a quality risk hold, if you will, and I'll talk about that more when we get to the Ohio Memorandum of Understanding. So your health plan, financial health, is impacted significantly by your quality outcome. And then again, the whole consumer satisfaction, not just from the perspective of what are the state and the feds looking at in terms of your health plan consumer satisfaction, but consumer satisfaction is a driver. Consumers vote with their feet. If they're not happy with the health plan, their access to care, how easy it is to use the health plan, are you responsive to my inquiries, my grievances and appeals, I'm going to walk with my feet next open enrollment. 
uh, the Medicaid program ties their enrollment, or in many states, ties their enrollment capacity for a health plan to quality outcomes. So the higher your quality score, the more opportunity you have to enroll people in your health plan, and that's also a factor with Medicare Part C programs as well. It's the ease of use, again, the plan services, et cetera. And then finally, a number of health plans have been founded on the mission of providing quality outcomes, higher quality outcomes, particularly for those health plans who are focused on serving publicly funded consumers. Next slide, please. Uh, the genesis of the quality management, again, is driven from federal and state regulations with a heavy emphasis from the perspective of the Federal HMO Act, Medicare, Medicaid standards. There are contractual obligations under Medicare, Medicaid, a number of consumer or commercial employers require certain quality outcomes in their contract. Accreditation, as I mentioned, is 50 to 70 percent based on quality outcomes, and then the healthcare organization itself, its specific mission around quality improvement. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the federal and state drivers for quality, uh, the dual demonstrations have the emphasis on quality outcomes. If you look at your various state uh, MOUs, as they become public, you'll see that probably two-thirds or, or half of the MOU requirements are around some of the health plan quality outcomes and the kinds of tools and initiatives that the feds and the state will use to audit those quality outcomes. Almost all Medicaid waivers, 1115 waivers in particular, have some kind of quality component in them, and the states have to demonstrate they're going to meet some of these quality components in order to get authorization for the waivers. The model of care which is the quality improvement plan, if you will, for Medicare Part C, specifically the special needs plans, or those plans that are designated to provide for dual eligible. And as well, all the dual demonstrations have a model of care. And that model of care has a number of components in it around quality indicators that health plans must meet. The Accountable Care Organization, established under the Affordable Care Act, are systems that are hospital-based, and their primary target is to, again, improve health outcomes, reduce readmission rates, reduce unnecessary hospitalization, and reduce unnecessary ER visits. And there are a number of quality standards that are inherent in those ACO contracts around the country. Um, I mentioned the ACA and the Federal HMO Act. Uh, state health insurance regulations, again, HMOs and PPOs are licensed at the state level, and there are a number of specific quality indicators that are inherent in that legislative mandate. Um, and then one of the major consumer-driven quality indicators is, of course, the CAP, the Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Provider System. And those are surveys that are administered to health plan enrollees that gauge what their level of satisfaction is around a myriad of domains to help evaluate whether the plan has been effective for serving the members. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a snapshot of one of the regulations from the state of Michigan HMO licensure under the insurance code. And this insurance code specifies, particularly in this section, what some of the quality assessment or quality improvement, quality management systems are required for an HMO. And I won't go into reading all of that. You can look at that at your leisure. But it's just an example of how state insurance codes incorporate the kind of quality standards that they're looking at, accreditation guidelines, et cetera. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the contractual drivers, once you have a Medicare contract, you have a lot of quality reporting that you have to meet. Uh, you also have to report out on the model of care that the health plan has developed in response to the Medicare guidelines. There are the state contracts uh, for Medicaid, HMO contracts, and a number of other issues. I think the underscore here is to understand that from a contractual perspective, the Fed, the state, and a number of commercial employers have introduced incentives and penalties that impact rate setting, enrollment priorities, and bonuses that are directly tied to quality performance. 
Next slide, please. Accreditation is a huge industry for health plans, um, a huge industry for accrediting bodies as well. Um, it's almost impossible to get a contract as a health plan or a PPO unless you have gone through the accreditation process. And this definition here is from URAC, and I know there are a couple of uh, AAA who are participating who have recently, in the last several years, become URAC accredited. But these are the primary accrediting bodies. Uh, JCO is almost solely focused on hospital accreditation. At one time, they did do uh, HMO accreditation, but haven't done it in about 10 years. URAC, which originally started out at monitoring and accrediting utilization review processes, has become a full-blown accrediting body for a number of different kinds of organizations. And then NCQA, which is for the HMO industry, kind of the gold standard for accreditation um, is a huge portion, and NCQA actually owns the heated measure that is so heavily used across the country. Next slide, please. Um, and then there, these are a couple of examples of mission and vision statements from health plans around the country where they actually have incorporated into their particular mission or vision statement the opportunity to provide high quality outcomes. And if you look at the uh, second one, AmeriHealth, this is focused on some of their publicly funded services and health care. Next slide. Some of the common clinical and non-clinical performance indicators, and you hear quality, you'll see quality performance, quality indicators. Uh, most of them are clinical, but there are a number of them that are non-clinical that still constitute quality management. Provider network adequacy, physician hospital credentialing, data reporting, consumer satisfaction, timely claims payment, et cetera. On the clinical side, depending on what kind of health services you're providing, you'll see a lot of emphasis on preventative health around things like childhood immunization, pre- and postnatal care, chronic disease management, asthma, COP, diabetes, et cetera. Heavy emphasis in the last 10 years on post-hospitalization care, particularly around that 30-day readmission issue that uh, has been incorporated into some of the Medicare contracting, uh, child and adolescent well care, and significant adult measures, adult BMI, measuring body weight as a factor as Obesity in America has become a significant issue. You'll start to see some of these uh, adult uh, quality indicators get more significant. And then, uh, to our gratitude, I know on the community-based side, a lot more emphasis, particularly from NCQA, the adherence on older adult quality indicators. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the conventional healthcare quality indices um, are around accreditation, and accreditation looks at your program, your program structure, and operations. PEDIS accounts for almost 50% of the entirety of the NCQA accreditation review, and then the CAP surveys, whether it's PEDIS, URAC, or whomever, those are very significant issues for health plans in terms of the uh, consumer satisfaction. From the Medicare perspective, as I mentioned, the model of care is a huge piece of the quality indicator. There are the star ratings, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And then also from Medicare are the ACO standards and quality uh, initiatives that have to be met and reported on. From the dual demonstration, purely dual demonstration perspective, uh, there is the memorandum of understanding, and those will include both the Medicare and the state Medicaid quality initiatives. Uh, as well, you'll find some state-specific additions to that beyond what may be inherent in the existing Medicaid contract, and then you'll see a lot of long-term care uh, specific indices included in the model of care. We'll highlight a couple of these uh, quality drivers in the next couple of slides. Um, and I would say to you that I just discovered on my review just before uh, the session started that slides 13 and 14 are quick, so I'm going to start with slide 14. 
Thank you. Uh, Edith, you'll hear a lot of discussion about this, especially your quality uh, management team, your care management team. They're going to hear Edith's facilities coming out of their you fill in the blank. Um, it stands for the Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information Set. And it's a set of measures used to evaluate the quality of outcome on particular healthcare measures. As I mentioned earlier, chronic care, diabetes management, prenatal and postnatal care, et cetera. For the most part, um, it is used by 90% of America's health centers. That is very significant. That is how much it has become institutionalized as a quality measure um, in this country. Um, it measures performance on important dimensions of care and service. There are about 75 measures across eight domains of care in balls and heated. And traditionally, what the health centers are trying to achieve is for their specific population, let's say for if you've got 300 people who are listed in your system as asthmatic, that becomes your denominator. And then your numerator are the number of people who are listed as asthmatic in your system who have met things like uh, reduced hospitalization, uh, have had prescriptions for appropriate asthma meds, you have been tracking that they're utilizing the asthma medication, they're reporting better health, health outcomes, your asthma attack, et cetera, et cetera. So what you're trying to achieve is at least a 50% of your 300 asthmatics have met the HEDIS indicators, and that 50 percentile to 90th percentile is where you get higher quality ratings and outcomes. Anything below the 50th percentile basically puts a health plan quality measure, that particular quality measure, at risk. Uh, again, HEDIS is required reporting for almost everything in the industry, Medicare, Part C plan, most Medicaid programs, and certainly for the dual demonstration. And it's based on, they draw the information from health plan and counter and claims data. Health plans spend a ton of money, millions of dollars, every year chasing HEDIS data. If it's not in their claims data, it may be in provider office medical records, and that's another opportunity for the community-based organization to help beef up that whole HEDIS data search by ensuring that you're reporting information as accurately and timely as possible. Okay, you can go to 13 now. Um, as I mentioned, uh, some of the domains, preventative and well care, older American or older adult measures, fall risk management, osteoporosis testing, and several others, and then chronic disease management, comprehensive diabetes care, are all your diabetics who are listed as diabetics getting the annual eye exam, the foot exam, uh, H, and the blood level screening. So those are critical factors that plans, and again, each one of these might have 30 or 40 different sub-index measures that have to be evaluated in order to meet these criteria. Okay, so 15, please. Thank you. Um, the model of care is the Medicare requirement for health plans who are applying for special needs plan status, those are the plans that are solely focused on the delivery of Medicare services, Medicare and Medicaid services for folks who are duly eligible. This is outside of what the dual demonstration, but the dual demonstration MOUs all require that health plans meet the qualifications of a model of care. Basically, it's your roadmap for how you're going to provide services to the population that will be enrolled in your special needs plan or your dual demonstration. And you have to take into account about 11 elements. Um, the MLC is reviewed by NCQA on behalf of CMS. The so NCQA has to approve a planned model of care, and that model of care is submitted annually with the Medicaid application unless you score at a certain level on your model of care and you don't have to renew it until the third year, but most new health plans have to renew that model of care annually. Um, there are 11 elements. Uh, first and foremost is the definition and evaluation of the needs of the target population. And this is a very valuable point, again, for CBOs because through your annual plan and program analysis and the development of your 
roadmap for the year, you collect a lot of very valuable data about what's going on from a public health perspective for seniors and persons with disabilities in your community and your ability to share that data with health plans is very vital for their development of the MLC. The MLC also defines a number of other issues, case management protocol, the interdisciplinary care team, which again, CBOs and their role and capacity to support effectively that integrated care delivery team is important. And then the MLC also just provides kind of the overview of the quality improvement program or quality management program. It identifies the quality improvement projects, the quality improvement studies, a chronic care management program, which is a unique aspect uh, for Medicare Part C, where you're identifying some specific disease states where you're going to have a particular focus or initiative around some of those disease states. Next slide, please. Uh, the model of model, <laughs> the memorandum of understanding is the precursor to the contract that will eventually be developed in the states where the dual administrations will be approved. And the model, the Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, is a joint development between CMS and the state. It's predominantly driven by some of the Medicare and the Medicaid federal rules around waivers, et cetera. But it also has a heavy emphasis on some of the initiatives that are critical to the dual demonstration and its mission and mantra. Um, it details the principles under which the state and CMS and the contracted health plans will implement and operate the dual demonstration. It eventually will become the blueprint for what will be the three-way contract for uh, the dual demonstration. And some of this information, um, the, the Ohio MOU, for those of you who have had access to that, I think maybe 20 pages of some of the quality measures. Um, and some of them include, again, consumer satisfaction. So you see cap over and over again as you walk this health plan quality road. Um, it, it includes the number of enrollees with an initial assessment completed within 90 days of enrollment. So again, CBOs have a critical opportunity to participate in helping health plans meet that particular quality measure and you've got, you've got the boots on the ground, you're out in the community, you're touching these people, seeing these people every day, you can help facilitate meeting that particular indicator. I'm very pleased to see this in a couple of, in this next bullet, in a couple of the MLUs, and that's the follow-up after hospitalization for mental illness. The whole mental, mental illness and mental health piece has not always been fully integrated into health plan quality initiatives, particularly because at some level, a number of health plans and states carve those services out of the Medicaid contract. And even from a Medicare perspective, it's been done via fee-for-service. So the dual demonstrations kind of force that whole integration. So there's going to be a lot more emphasis with these dual demonstrations around some of the services provided for preventative and follow-up care for uh, mental health. Um, readmission rates, there's a huge emphasis through the dual demonstrations and through the ACL to reduce uh, readmission rates, uh, reduce risk of falling, another of the older, uh, older adult measures that you'll see quite frequently throughout. And then another huge aspect of the dual demonstration is around uh, deinstitutionalizing some of the consumers. So the opportunity to have a larger portion of those enrollees receiving care and living effectively and efficiently as they define it and as defined by the quality measures is going to be a critical aspect. Next slide, please. Uh, the star rating system is used by Medicare Health, Medicare to do a report card for a Medicare health plan. It's used for both the commercial Part C plans and as well for the special needs plan. Uh, it's Medicare specific. It scores one to five, high being, five being the highest rating. And with the STAR program, bonus, the bonus program for Medicare rate setting is tied to your STAR rating. So plans with the three to five rating actually get to reintroduce from bonus payment they would have received from Medicare for achieving that star bonus status by 
adding that money back into their overall rates, and their rates tend to fall. So if it would have originally been $35 for a vision screening, the bonus payment applied. Now the out-of-pocket cost for the consumer for that vision screening may be $10 or may be zero, depending on what the bonus looks like. So it's an opportunity. If I'm looking at the star rating as a consumer and I see three plans have a two and five plans have a five, I'm going to assume that the plans with the five have a better rating. But additionally, as I look more into those plan options, I will see that the plans with the five may actually be less expensive for me out of pocket as a consumer. Um, the plans who are rated two or below could be subject to termination from the Medicare program, which it takes you a long time to get back to Medicare since rates are since we did this next. Um, the star rating program uses, again, the repetition and redundancy of PEDIS, CAPS, and other. There are about nine domains, 52 measures across those nine domains that, again, Emphasis on preventative and wellness, managing chronic condition, health care responsiveness around consumer perspective, and then member complaints and appeal. Next slide, please. Uh, the opportunity, again, through the dual demonstrations and other contracts outside. I know a number of uh, community-based organizations are working with some of their local ACOs. There's opportunities to work with some of the federally qualified health centers in support of some of their initiatives around quality improvement and their Medicare and Medicaid dollars. So one of the things that I think we can look at are around how do the CBOs align themselves around some of the health plan quality initiatives. Again, the utilization review. Do you currently have a strong utilization review of the services you provide? Were you looking at appropriateness of care? Uh, are you tiering levels? So you've got folks who have high needs, have a higher focus and intervention level, folks with moderate needs, do you have adjusted to care at that level? Are the services you're providing appropriate and consistent with what the needs are? And do you have evidence-based programming or standards that you're utilizing to evaluate that? Um, what are your own internal plans, and how well do you have data to support that says what you're doing from a utilization review is appropriate, consistent, and leading to quality outcomes? Um, health and your outcomes as dictated to you from the Older Americans Act, your state waivers, how much do those align with, and, and there's a lot of alignment from my perspective between what NCQA is looking for, what CAPS is looking for, what um, URAC and some of those other organizations are looking for. There's a lot of alignment for the opportunity for you to say, we can support your NCQA accreditation. We can support your dual demonstration contracting because we're already doing six of these domains and here's the data that we have to support that. Consumer satisfaction is heavily driven by the engagement with the consumer. So for the most part, health plans very rarely ever see or touch their enrollees. 99% of the delivery of health care from the health plan perspective is done by their provider network. You become a vital part of that provider network in influencing how consumers perceive the health plan. Population-based quality improvement. Again, the MOC heavy emphasis in that um, determining what kinds of issues, public health issues are out there for the folks in the service area that the health plan will involve. You're collecting that information. You can provide that. It's valuable information for the health plan, particularly around some of the non-clinical issues that impact overall quality of health outcomes. Data analysis and evaluations and process improvement. Health information, health information technology is a critical factor. How quickly, how easily, how comprehensive is your database? Not just do you have the data, but do you have ongoing analytics and evaluation that gets funneled into quality improvement projects and processes? And then finally, the financial incentives. As I mentioned several times, there is a huge stake for health plans P&L around quality initiatives. Health plans partner with providers who help them meet and recover all their money. For instance, in the Ohio MOU, 
around the quality rentals. The first year of the agreement, the health plans will, will have a 1% withhold of their payments that they have to earn back to meeting those quality metrics. The second year, that increases to 2%. And then in the third year, because by the third year, they should have worked out all the kinks, it's a 3% withhold. So imagine you've got an $8 million or a $20 million dual demonstration contract and 3% of your money is being withheld until you meet those quality and performance indicators. You want providers on your side who are going to help you get all that money back. The other side of that is its health plans are going to be looking for providers who are prepared to help assume or share some of that risk. And so you may very well be looking at your performance is going to determine what your financial, what your opinion is going to look like as well. Next slide. Thank you. Um, just underscoring some of the critical resources for CBOs to start looking at in terms of how you more closely align your quality management system to your potential new customers. Um, definitely, you have to take a look at the MOU and the dual demonstration contract. That's the roadmap if you've got a dual demonstration going on. The Medicare manual, particularly the quality management chapter, um, which is where the um, MOC is listed, but a number of the other managed Medicare quality initiatives for other contracting outside of the dual demonstration are inherent in that document. Familiarize yourself, have team on board, send folks to NCQA conferences. NCQA is needed, as I mentioned, the granddaddy, the gold standard, the good housekeeping seal of approval, and other accrediting uh, entity standards. The CAP surveys, look at those consumer surveys and identify opportunities for your staff to help support consumers, A, responding to those surveys and influencing positive outcomes through their interaction with your organization on behalf of the health plan. The ACO contract has significant factors in it around what are the quality outcomes that the hospitals who have these ACO uh, standards and ACO contracts, what do they have to meet, how do they meet them. If you're a subcontractor for those hospital ACO you want to know what the feds are looking at so you can align your services and support to help them maximize those outcomes. State Medicaid contracts, I've said this before, I know a number of you have heard this from me before. There's a population outside of the dual that are kind of headed into dual eligibility, the age one disabled population, there's the social security income, disability income population, high health needs, multiple chronic conditions, health plans to use some of the same help with them as will be provided for duals in terms of outside services. They may not be compelled to do it by state edict, but a number of health plans are becoming savvy. And I know we worked with the health plan in Detroit when I was with the AAA to look at how do we help support management of that population. A lot of those dictates are inherent in that contract with the state. Um, the standard health organization provider agreement. There are a lot of equality initiatives that you'll be required to meet that will be documented in those contracts, either in the base of the contract and in many cases, a number of them, particularly around the dual demonstration in the agenda. Um, look at the health plan quality improvement program. Ask for a copy of it. Read it. Identify what are some of their hot spots, what are some of the issues, and also ask them, where have they been dinged by the state, by Medicare, by employers, and where are they looking to provide improvement? And then the health plan report card. Um, it NCQA publishes annually, as do several other um, reporting entities, a health plan quality report card. I, I'm pleased to say that the health plan that I ran here in Michigan, here in Michigan, was consistently ranked amongst the top 100 Medicaid health plans in the country, and a lot of that was driven by what our heated outcomes and our consumer satisfaction surveys look like. Next slide, please. These are just a number of the references that I utilized, and boy, does that look good the way you guys make <laughs> And that's the end of my presentation. Um, Lauren, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks so much, Sharon. 
Um, I think I'm going to check through our questions in the chat uh, before we go to our next presenter. Um, and we did have a question come in, um, and this is actually in reference to slide 16. So I'm going to go back to that. Um, and so they're asking, are the plan expectations specific to Ohio? Um, and if so, were these measures recommended by CMS, developed by the state, or negotiated between the two? Um, she says she's trying to determine whether the same or similar issues may be included in other states' MOUs. That's a very good question. Um, let me say this, that first, the MOUs quality measures are going to start with the base of Medicare and Medicaid standardized issues. So there's going to be what you would traditionally see in a Medicare contract. That's going to be the basis for the MOU quality indicators. Then CMS and the state negotiate on what may be some state Medicaid-specific and or some state long-term care-specific measures that need to be included. So your, the first part of your question, is this going to be what we see in almost all MOUs? For the most part, yes. The second part of your question, will there be variations based on the state? That question is also yes. So each MOU is going to be specific and unique in some part to the state that it's been designed for. OK. Um, actually, somebody wanted to, I'm going to put back your last slide to get your email address up. I clicked away too quickly. Oh, uh, so, so, so here's Sharon's email address. And I'm just checking for chat. I don't see any additional questions. So um, I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and move to our second speaker. Um, and then we'll take questions on the phone and chat um, once she's finished. Uh, so now I would like to introduce and welcome our second speaker, who is Sandy Atkins. Uh, Sandy is the Vice President, Institute for Change at Partners in Care Foundation. Uh, thank you, Sandy. You are welcome to begin. And I'm going to pull up your slide. should be up now. And you're welcome to start. Or, Sandy, you might be on mute. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks so much. Um, nice, nice to be with you, Sharon. That was incredible. Um, it's my my uh, presentation is a little bit more in the weeds, with some examples of of specific measures and specific programs and things that we tend to do that can help d just to kind of create a um, an orientation toward you know what are we what are we discussing with health plans when we talk about how we can help with the um, quality measures. So uh, next slide. That's just how CBOs can impact quality. Um, next slide. Here we go. So I'd like to start with the triple aim, and I, hopefully you've all heard of it, but the Institute for Healthcare Improvement um, basically started this and then adopted it and called, called it the three-part aim. But in general, it, it tends to be the same thing. And the reason for doing this is, is just to keep a, pers a kind of a balanced perspective. So um, healthcare um, contracting and activities are motivated in all three areas. And I, to me, this is sort of a mantra. I just keep reminding myself, better population health, better pa patient experience of care, lower per capita costs. So in, in general, um, we look for a balance of these things. Um, both population health and patient experience of care are in the quality domain. Um, and I think actually some, there are some quality measures that relate to costs and uh, particularly efficiency of care. Um, but also in, in addition to the triple aim, I think a couple of things that health, I'm talking more specifically about health plans, ACOs, that kind of thing. Um, member retention is a primary metric because, and it's sort of the ultimate expression of, of satisfaction, um, but they they want they will we will be measured on on helping them with me member retention, 
And um, another thing to think about is everybody in healthcare wants physicians to be happy. And um, when we help um, keep their patients healthy and well managed, that makes physicians more satisfied themselves. Oh, I'm trying to, to scroll through myself. Next slide. <laughs> So when we talk about the first part of the triple aim, better population health, so what do we do? Um, what's related to better population health? First of all, better care coordination. So here's some of the things that we do that relate to better population health. That's uh, to our care transitions programs, the CCTP. Um, we are very often have service coordination, navigation, um, either at the waiver level or at lower levels, depending on what our funding sources are, and also improved access to care. So we've got transportation, helping people schedule their appointments, sending a companion along. So the, those are all things that relate to better care coordination and the first part of the triple aim. In, a, in addition, better population health, um, what we particularly influence is improved functioning and behavioral health. In some cases also, you know, health in, the, in terms of diagnoses. But in particular, um, we address, so enhanced fitness, fit and strong, healthy moves, Tai Chi, those are all improved functioning, um, better strength. That better balance, those sorts of things, and our pearls and healthy ideas evidence-based programs address the behavioral health domain, and the Stanford programs kind of um, go across all of it in improving self-management, which drives better behaviors, um, better symptom control, lower utilization, all of those things. Next slide. So in better patient experience, um, and another way to think of it is um, satisfaction. Um, one of the things that we've learned is what's very important to health plans when we're contracting with them is that we represent them. We're not representing ourselves, not, not my, our agency, not our network. We're representing the plan, the provider group, that sort of thing, which may even mean wearing name tags that represent them. Um, but because we do these things, we improve their, the patient's experience by visiting them in the hospital, then following up, visiting them at home. Obviously, you'll recognize care transitions, coaching. Um, we have a relation, they will have a relationship with us as care coordinators. We provide them things they need that they may have been having problems getting, like transportation. Um, we do the benefits checkup. So there's a great way to make a health plan um, member more satisfied with the health plan is that we help them have better lives in general, um, you know, access food, access benefits, access income, supplements, those kinds of things that they may not even know about, and help them find free and discounted services, of course. Um, that's going to make people happy, and it's what we do. Next slide. And finally, lower per capita costs. Um, I think in general, our quality enhancements that we work on need to be at least cost neutral. Um, we can't always do a positive return on investment, but of course that's, that's the best possible outcome, that we improve quality, we improve patient satisfaction, we improve health, and um, we save money. Um, other ways to um, improve lower capita, per capita costs would be to reduce falls, which are very costly in terms of emergency, uh, skilled nursing care for rehabilitation. So we have a number of programs like Matter of Balance, Healthy Moves, Home Meds that um, are directly aimed at reducing falls. Um, our, the exercise ones are a little bit um, one step back from, from that, but obviously we'll also have um, effect on re fall reduction. Um, reducing ED visits. So uh, again, our fall prevention symptom management. So if you've got, um, you know, in care transitions, you have those red flags. If we teach people what they are, um, we can present ourselves as an al alternative to 911 by keeping a call center or um, telling people how to get th that care from their health plan. So the health plan may have a call center, and our job would be to connect them with that. Um, and of course, self-management, um, understanding, following your diet orders, following your, uh, maintaining your meds is going to keep you out of the ED emergency department. 
Um, finally, reducing admissions and readmissions. Um, we have care transitions intervention here in California. We're doing the bridge program out of um, Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, and we have enhanced fitness and Stanford self-management program. So the idea is that we have a whole array of um, services, or if you're a doctor, you would call that your armamentarium of, uh, of services to help with the triple aim. Next slide. So here we get into some of those specific measures that Sharon was talking about. So the older adult measures, um, during the year, the person, um, each, each older adult should receive advanced care planning, which is help with advanced directives, medication review, functional status assessment, and pain assessment. And these are all things that we do or can help with. Um, these are all typical waiver care management services, and with one home visit for us, we would meet we would meet all of these older adult measures for a plan or a provider group. Next slide. Um, and then as Sharon mentioned, uh, for Medicare Advantage plans, they have the star ratings. And here we have a yearly review of all medications and supplements being taken. Um, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't all, always plug home meds. So <laughs> that's part of what we do there. Um, a yearly pain screening or pain management plan. Again, you know, we, when you're doing a full assessment for somebody, you're, you're talking about their pain um, and then creating a care plan to help them manage that or uh, working on a care plan, maybe not creating it in a context of a health plan. Um, controlling blood pressure, it's something that we work on, and I'll talk a little bit later about how we do some of these things. Reducing risk of falling, readmission within 30 days of discharge, um, they, they get dinged on um, plan members over age 65 who are on high-risk medications when there may be safer drug choices. And high-risk is usually defined by something called the Beers criteria. And um, that's uh, the American Geriatric Society issues those criteria. Um, and then medication adherence for hypertension. So these are all things that we can help with. And um, not only is it just a flat quality measure, but as Sharon mentioned, the four and five star plans are getting bonuses, and those bonuses are increasing. Next slide. Uh, physicians have their own HEDIS measures. So uh, large provider groups, we have a contract to do some post-acute uh, interventions with um, patients of a large provider group. Um, and for some for some reason, um, HEDIS measures talk about 60, age 66 plus, whereas star ratings talk about age 65 plus. Um, who knows why? Um, so HEDIS for physicians, um, they, they would have a goal of not prescribing high-risk medications. And those include things that affect your balance, um, things that can cause confusion, uh, increased risk of falls, gastric bleeding. There are a number of reasons for um, calling certain medications high risk in older adults. Um, fall management is another. So they're supposed to have a discussion and a management plan for falls. Um, and in addition, uh, HEDIS measures for physicians include potentially harmful drug disease interactions. So they've got a, when they're prescribing something, the idea is you put, you prescribe in the context of the whole patient and not just, oh, today your symptom is this, so I'm going to prescribe X. And then, you know, when you look at the whole picture, um, what you just prescribed could cause an exacerbation of, of something else that the patient has. Next slide. I was going to say next measure. Um, so taking a little deeper dive into those physician standards, so um, all of those, um, the high-risk medications are all associated with higher hospitalization in community dwelling elders, which um, goes back to the uh, lower per capita cost part of the triple aim. So anytime you're talking hospitalization, you're talking about high cost and also high suffering. So that's why, you know, you talk about it in, in a quality, um, and that quality goes from the person themselves, and it ripples out to the whole healthcare system and society. Um, and of course, um, those high-risk 
medications have adverse drug reactions and cost. Uh, again, the potentially harmful drug disease interactions, there's just some interesting things to look at. So pe people will give you uh, something to manage your bladder, um, and those are in the drug class called anticholinergic. So if you've got um, uh, urge incontinence and they give you that, but then it decreases, it in increases your dementia that's not a good combination. Or if you're falling and you're taking certain uh, medications, uh, you might be depressed, but you then you're going to be in a hospital and you'll be even more depressed. So the whole idea of this is, again, to look at the whole patient. Next slide. So um, when, you're, when you're talking to health plans um, about uh, their quality measures. Fall prevention is one of the door openers, as I call them. Um, so it's the um, here's the actual standard um, fall risk management. Percent of Medicare members. This is a star rating measure, by the way, who had a fall or had problems with balance or walking who received fall risk intervention. And um, below is just a little example of something that <coughs> one of um, a triple, the AAA in Tarrant County, um, Texas, is doing. So they joined a local fall prevention collaborative with the hospitals, public health, um, partnered with the fire department who m mapped their 911 calls for falls, and then they target those people for matter of balance and home meds for frequent fallers. That's such a win-win. Um, <coughs> the partnerships, the programs that we have in our <coughs> in our portfolio and the, um, the results in, in reduced falls, reduced cost, and better quality measures. Next slide. Medication management um, is another door opener. We find that, you know, obviously this is our own program, so it would be logical for us to use this. Um, but we find that you can just literally see people start sitting up straighter and leaning forward when you start talking about what we can do about medications because uh, they know that they have no idea what's in the home. There's just, we've done um, home meds on people who had just had a so-called medication reconciliation in the home, and 66% of them came up with, with problems that a pharmacist thought the prescriber needed to know about. So we're addressing um, fall risk, we're addressing those high-risk medications, uh, we're addressing hypertension control with the home meds protocols and the pain control and assessment, as well as the potentially dangerous side effects of many um, pain medications. Um, and in care transitions, this serves as a medication reconciliation, which is a requirement from NCQA for health plans. So, you know, it all comes back into the, the programs that we can offer people. Next slide. So what else can we do? A lot of the quality measures are specific to screening and um, access to care. So what can we do to help with those, getting people to their mammogram or their glaucoma test? Well, we can provide transportation or transportation assistance, help them with their scheduling for cer you know, certain of the clients that need that extra help or encouragement. Um, they may just keep putting it off, but if you give them a call and say, you know, can I help you make the, the appointment, they, they're more likely to say yes. Um, we can also help with clinical outcomes. So um, medication adherence, if you've got a care management program, you're in the home, then you can help them um, like with, with our typical waivers. You can do things like uh, medication dispensers, as well as discussions, reminders, um, some of the apps that you can get on a cell phone that ring a reminder. You know, there's all kinds of things now to help with blood pressure and hypertension control. And of course, exercise and um, diet also affect those, which, which we take care of too. Cholesterol, we've got our meals, dietary counseling, medication adherence, diabetes, we might have a fund for purchasing monitoring supplies beyond those that the person can afford helping them with meals, dietary con counseling, diabetes self-management program, counseling the family. So if, you know, if you've got a family that eats traditional high-carb food and the person is supposed to be following a low-carb diet, then 
um, you can help the, the whole family figure out how to, you know, how to do these. There are low-carb tortillas. We could have those instead, things like that. So there's some very creative ways that we can help with the clinical outcomes and the screenings that are part of the clinical side of quality measures. Next slide. Um, another uh, domain of quality of population health is in the Healthy People 2020. Um, some, pretty soon it's going to be 2030, I'm sure. And they've recently added an older adult um, measures in Healthy People 2020. And the measures in Healthy People are goals of you know a percent of people who have confidence managing their chronic conditions. Well, obviously. Lee, if you've ever done chronic disease self-management and the other Stanford programs, you know that um, that's one of the, thing, the great results of those programs. Um, receipt of the diabetes self-management benefit, well, we're, we've been working on getting our provider numbers so that we can provide the diabetes self-management program in the context of the diabetes self-management education benefit. So that gives us a value um, in, in that uh, quality measure. Leisure time physical activities among older adults. Of course, we have all our evidence-based programs like Enhanced Fitness, Fit and Strong, and um, caregiver support. We've got savvy, powerful tools. ED visits due to falls. We've got home meds, matter of balance, healthy moves, all of which have positive effects on falls. Next slide. So um, just to give you one idea of what a health plan has to do to become accredited. Case management is one of the areas where they become accredited. And um, look at the assessment that they're supposed to do. Clinical history, medications, ADLs, cognitive, psychosocial, health behaviors, life planning, linguistic, culture, vision, caregiver resources, available benefits, community resources. And what was in my head was sound familiar. <laughs> um, but they tend to do this only by telephone, but for their high-risk members, the folks that we're used to seeing, we know that a phone call isn't going to do all of this. So that home visit, when you have trouble connecting with the person, is going to help the health plan um, meet this um, accreditation um, metric. Next slide. Um, in our recent discussions, we're working with um, a health plan in California, actually on their exchange population. But they raised an issue of, are you licensed? Are you accredited? And um, they actually reached out to NCQA and are asking for permission to use our services and have it not uh, affect their NCQA accreditation. So I put how can, can we hurt quality measures? Well, if, if they are held to certain standards and we don't meet their standards, we could potentially hurt, hurt the health plans, our, our partners that we so much need and want to have relationships with. So they have, they have rules about to whom they can delegate um, different services and why. Um, and so in order for us to accept delegation from them, um, there are certain things we can't do. So they have to do a care plan. We can only make recommendations. We can't refer patients. They have to refer patients. So there are things that they cannot delegate. So we have to a, a, first know that, you know, don't be offended if they say they've got to make all the referrals. It's because of the, their accreditation standards. Um, but we have to, you know, our information systems have to meet their standards. All of our documentation has to meet their standards. We have to have quality assurance programs in place, and we have to, to have the metrics to prove to them um, and to NCQA, because then by delegation we could be audited as well as they could. In addition, um, our, we could possibly adversely affect their customer service in certain ways. For example, you know, typically in a waiver you've got you know, a couple of weeks to you know, do things and then a couple more re weeks to do something else. And, but you know, we're, we're not going to be on that kind of timeline anymore. Uh, those of you who have experience with care transitions know that it's a real culture change to start, you know, to, tomorrow I've got to be in that home, not um, next week or the week after. Um, also, um, we have to be very careful at representing ourselves in that relationship with the health plan because if they think the health 
health plan is sending a lot of strangers and they sense uncoordinated care that could actually adversely affect their quality ratings. Next slide. So um, I was thinking about this, and it's like it, it, everything we're talking about here is our usual business, but the, it's the way we do it. We can't be doing it in a business-as-usual way. So all, all of what I've talked about is stuff we're already doing for somebody, um, either through Older Americans Act funding or grants, or if we're um, lucky and on the cutting edge um, already through some um, contracts with health plans, hospitals, ACOs, et cetera. But now we're going to have to do it better and faster. And we've heard comments from health plans saying, you know, talking to CBOs saying, well, we don't do it that way. We, we can't do that. And really to succeed, it's got to be a new culture. And it, it basically it's how high, you know, it's not yes or it's not, no is not an answer. And we have to come up to this new standard. And also we have to really get used to measuring ourselves, being measured from outside sources, keeping data. And um, one lesson learned that we have, uh, Partners in Care, is that when you have a contract, you need to make sure that they are going to give you data about your performance as well as you giving them data about your performance. Because we've had some struggles trying to prove our impact. And we can't do that without some of their their claims data, their clinical data, and things like that that we just will never have access to. So we're writing that into some of our contracts. Not, not, not only do we have to meet your standards, but you kind of have to meet ours too. And you have to share this performance data so that together we can uh, continuously improve quality. Next slide. I think this is the end. There we go. Excellent. Thank you, Sandy. Um, let's see. I think what we'll do now is I will ask uh, Shirley if we could open up for Q&A, if you could please provide instructions for asking a question uh, through, the, through the audio line. That would be great. Certainly. If you'd like to ask a question on the phone line, just press star 1 and record your name clearly. Again, press star 1 to ask a question. And one moment, please, for our first question. Sure. So while well, we're waiting for questions to come in on the phone, we'll run through some that have come in um, over the chat. Um, and this first question, uh, I think it's for you, Sandy, says, can you explain how you conduct pain assessments? What tool do you use, and what are staff credentials? OK. Uh, pain assessments in our context is the 10-point pain scale, which you can do you know, either with the the frowny faces and the smiley faces, or just um, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the um, worst pain imaginable. So there are evidence-based pain questions that pretty much anybody can administer. So we're typically doing that either with a social worker. In, in California, our waiver program has nurses. So in the initial assessment, they may be doing that, but it's um, not required that it be administered by a nurse. So it's a very, it's a very um, simple, evidence-based, um, um, I believe it's been um, certified for kind of a anybody that asked the question correctly. OK. And uh, here's another question. Um, it says, MCOs require licensed personnel for most programs, a matter of balance, and other evidence-based programs or lay leader models. How do you? or how to frame this with the MCOs? Typically, uh, uh, are you asking me what, yes. what we've found in our, in our endeavors is that they don't have to be provided by licensed personnel. They have to be supervised by licensed personnel. So you know, if we've got social workers, they're, they're um, what we in California call an LCSW. It seems to be a licensed clinical social worker, or whatever your state equivalent of that is. Um, the diabetes self-management can be a registered dietitian. So we haven't found that they are requiring that programs be delivered by um, licensed personnel, but rather that they be supervised by health by personnel. But that there are also state managed care requirements. So um, generally, I think they're 
primarily related to NCQA, um, which from what I've seen doesn't require certain services to be delivered by um, licensed personnel. So that may, it may be a state managed care regulation that they have, or it may be um, kind of their fear of delegating uh, to unqualified people, and it may be their lawyers rather than um, any regulation. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of negotiation and, and try to find out. A ask them specifically what rule, you know, to quote you uh, chapter and verse. Sharon might have um, something else to say about that because <coughs> she's come from the other side of the world. Um, I, I would echo what you just shared, Sandy. In some cases, it is going to be driven by a state regulation. I know Illinois, for example, has some very specific restrictions about some of the delivery of some of those community-based services, even driven down to the level it has to be performed by people that are part of a certain contracted union. In many other cases where it's not a state mandate, or a Medicare, because sometimes it's payer-driven. Medicare or Medicaid only allows for a particular service to be delivered in this kind of facility by this kind of licensed personnel. So going back to Sandy, if it's chapter and verse from Medicare or Medicaid or one of those kinds of payers, I would look to have that documented in the contract. And then the other option is that sometimes health plans put those specific uh, provisions in place as a means of defensive medicine, um, you know, again, driven as Sam said by the lawyers, um, or sometimes that's just the proclivity of their medical director and their quality improvement team. In that case, it may not be a regulatory or legislative mandate, but it's a plan prerogative, and if it's what they've documented in their quality improvement or quality management plan, I don't know that you have a lot of wiggle room around it. Yeah, just, just yesterday we were on a call with um, a health plan at the contract negotiation stage, and we're talking about an in-home assessment, care transitions, and they, they accepted the wording that it could be delivered by a social worker, a community health worker, medical assistant, you know, so they were willing to have all kinds of non-licensed personnel deliver the service mm -hmm. as long as it's supervised. Mm -hmm. Right. By a licensed person. And supervision does not mean they have to be in the same room or necessarily even in the same building. Correct. Sometimes it's just the oversight and an over a review of the work that, that's been performed to ensure that it's meeting the standards and consistent with the evidence-based um, review process that's in place. Okay, uh, and before we check uh, the phones, uh, another question um, <clears throat> for Sandy. Do you see any potential conflicts if you represent the plan, so wearing their name badge and secure contracts with more than one plan in the area? Um, and this question comes from our, our Donnie Green and our from the Texas network, and, and so... She writes saying, hi, I'm Donnie, and I'm with Melina, or I mean Superior, I mean Amerigroup. So, <laughs> um, I, one of the things that, that we've, there are phone systems that can actually, you know, it, certainly for incoming calls, there are phone systems that can show you that it's a Blue Shield caller versus a Melina caller, that kind of thing. For outbound calls, um, um, <laughs> I guess it's a matter of training habits and get lots of sleep. <laughs> right. So I would say yes. Someday you're going to do. A, you're, you're probably going to put your foot in it someday, and then that will help you learn. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, uh, so Shirley, did we have any questions come in on the phone? We do have one question, and again, just press star one to ask a question. Our first question comes from Albert Trevelyan. Can you ask your question? Yes, hello, thank you. First, uh, uh, thank you very much for these uh, presentations. I thought they were very helpful and very informative. I want to wrote back into something that uh, Sandy Atkins had mentioned around the triple aim. Um, I, and I'm seeing these presentations uh, that chance to address the quality and the cost. I'm wondering if the presenters uh, could talk about how 
uh, both of these areas could work toward the population level and cover that third part of the triple aim. Sandy, do you want to go first? Um, you know, I, I I have a little trouble with population health as a as a picture in your mind that you're addressing the entire population. But to me, it's more that you're you're looking. At, Population health management comes from looking at data and finding portions of your population that are high risk and then um, addressing those through systematic programs that um, look for high risk people and take care of their needs. So it's not, you know, it's not an intervention at the population level, but rather an approach to populations um, by in essence, improving individual health on a targeted basis rather than sitting and waiting for people to ask you for things. So that, that's where, and in the context of the health plans, they have to make the referrals because they have the data on their membership. So they'll say, we, and, and we present our you know, risk criteria that we think are appropriate for our programs. So it'll be, you know, they've been in the ED twice in six months, they're taking six or more medications, they've had a recent fall, whatever the risk criteria is appropriate to the program we're offering, and then they have to make the referrals based on the data in their system. Does that at all answer? You know, I think that's a helpful context and a good way to look at it. I'm wondering about uh, partnering with other types, other agencies, that also work in that in that kind of, of data level, public health or or some other agencies that um, uh, that really kind of, of of section out the population by those by those pieces. Your turn, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's a good point that there are a myriad of organizations and entities that are looking at some of these same kinds of you know, youth population parenthetically. Um, so if you look from a health plan perspective, though, when you talk about population or targeted population and quality management, often you're talking in the context of kind of a heated domain, if you will. So if you think of population as, okay, I have 100,000 members and 5,000 of them are listed in my system as asthmatic. So that's a targeted population where I'm going to apply some of the standard evidence-based asthma intervention monitoring programs to provide X, Y, and Z service. And th this is the outcome I'm trying to achieve. So one of the quality outcomes is I want to reduce ED visits. I want to reduce inpatient stays. I want to reduce missed work, missed school, what have you, blah, blah, blah. So what other entities are out there who are interested in that? If I understand your question, well, certainly school districts have a vested interest in supporting reduced lost time at school. Um, employer groups certainly have a vested interest in parents not having to miss work because of sick kids or their own employees who are asthmatic. And then certainly the health plans have a vested interest in keeping those asthmatic members as healthy as possible. So I think you have to look from the perspective of are you talking about a health plan and are you talking about the public health institutions in your community? and then define kind of here's what my population management support system can do to help you. So you might have to, like your, your resume is generic, but if you're applying for specific jobs, then you have to turn that very generic resume into a very pointed and specific job-oriented uh, tool. And as far as um, the public health domain goes, the one of the entry points for uh, CBOs to become involved in those kind of, kind of partnerships is um, through the, the hospitals have their community health needs assessments and they, they target healthy, typically healthy people 2020 kind of uh, measures. So that's where you can become involved, sort of like Tarrant County did in a, for example, that uh, community-wide falls prevention initiative and then bring the kinds of interventions you have to that. Okay. Um, are there any other, do we have any other questions that have come in on the phone? At this time, I'm showing no questions on the phone lines. 
Okay. And actually, um, Albert, I think since we have, we still have a, two more minutes or so, I noticed that you had sent in another question um, earlier. I think this was directed towards Sharon, and it says, how does the uh, recognition of the person-centered medical home by the NCQA, uh, the National Committee for Quality Assurance, vary from other means of recognizing person-centered medical homes related to how it will work with CBOs? Albert, do you ever ask any easy questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, there are going to be variations. Um, NCQA created this uh, primary care casement or medical home certification process. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield has their own primary care, primary home verification uh, standard as well. And so what NCQA has done is that if a provider office meets this particular criteria, it's the equivalent of saying you meet certain, certain quality standards that have been established and benchmarked, much like the accreditation that NCQA provides to um, health plans. So there's a certain level of, again, the good housekeeping seal of approval on standardized practices that you use, outcome measures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how that's going to relate to community-based organizations, um, I know NCQA is looking at it as well as URAC, who is now accrediting um, AAAs and other community-based organizations. I know that they're looking at establishing some standards for that kind of unique AAA slash community-based organization benchmarks and uh, accreditation, if you will, but I haven't seen any real detail about how that's going to play out. What I suspect will happen is once NCQA gives it its blessing, then the rest of the industry will fall in line. And what you may find, as Sandy mentioned earlier, is it becomes one of the criteria that you have to meet in order to contract with the health plan. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Sharon. Um, and I think we're right about, we're actually we're a little past our time, but before we go, I did want to point out, and I'm going to pull it up on Sharon's slides here, uh, that Mary had Mary Kashek from N4A had referenced in our Q&A. Uh, the second bullet there, the report uh, from the Commonwealth Fund, um, at the end of this article, there's a nice summary of the uh, quality measures included in the dual stem L, uh, MO, used by state. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out because we thought okay. that would be helpful. Um, and beyond that, just thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much to uh, both of our speakers for such uh, informative and comprehensive presentations. Um, and enjoy uh, the rest of your afternoon. Thank you Thank very you. much, Lauren. Great job, Sandy. It's been Thanks. a pleasure. Thanks, Sharon. <laughs> This does conclude today's conference. We thank you for your participation. At this time, you may disconnect your line.